Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to see you all. I was just thinking about that last song that we did. You're never going to let me down. And yet there are times when we feel let down. And that's what we're going to look at today. We're going to look at the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We finally reached the last chapter of Luke, believe it or not. And there, I can only imagine how the disciples felt and how the women felt about everything that happened and how disillusioned they were about who Jesus was. And they thought that he would be the Messiah. He would be the one who would free Israel from Roman captivity. He would be the one who would come and begin to reign from Israel on the, on the throne of his father, David, in Jerusalem. That he would be the king on earth and that he would obliterate all injustices. And of course, there were some who thought they would just have everlasting food because Jesus was good at making it. <laughs> and that they wouldn't have to pay taxes to Caesar. And they just, I'm sure they could have sang that song too while he was alive. You are good. You're never going to let me down. And then he goes and dies on a cross. And we have the advantage of looking back and understanding Amen. why. And that's what today is about. So pray with me. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for worship. When we can declare to you in song and words those things that are upon our hearts. And you are so much more worthy than all that we give and all that we do. And yet you accept our sacrifice as uh, acceptable. I pray that you would help us, Lord, to hear your voice today. And as we go through your word, that your spirit would whisper truths to our hearts that we need to hear, that you would apply it to those areas of our life where we need healing or encouragement or new vision. And I pray that you'd help us to understand what it is that you will never let us down. Help us now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we come to the empty tomb of Jesus for the first time. If you remember the last time we were here, well, actually, we've been going through this in, uh, for a couple of weeks. We see Pilate taking Jesus and declaring him innocent and yet was forced by the crowd, so he would say, to crucify Jesus and hand him over to the will of the Pharisees. We were introduced to all of the characters, Pontius Pilate, who interviewed him several times and said, I find nothing at all wrong with this man. He even washes his hands in public. We see Herod Antipas who wants him to perform a miracle and wants him to do some kind of a trick in his presence. And he wouldn't. In fact, he, did, he didn't give him a word. Like a, shear bef like a sheep before a shear is dummy. So he answered not a word. And we saw how he put this sign over top of him. This is the king of the Jews in three different languages. He did it in Greek, which was the universal language of the people at that time. He did it in Latin, which was the language of government. And so it was a declaration from the government. And he also did it in Hebrew, so that those who were Jewish would understand that this is their king, and he's letting the people have their will for him to be crucified. And we see that Jesus stumbling under the weight the Romans take care of that by finding Simon the Cyrene, who comes up, has to carry the cross with Jesus. What a tremendous privilege that is. And Jesus asks us to do the same, right? He tells us to take up our cross and follow him. Last week, we looked at the crucifixion, where Jesus was up on the cross with the two thieves, on one on either side. He was put in a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull, it's also called Mount Calvary. Calvary is where we get uh, the word cranium. Uh, it means skull. Same thing, different language. And so he takes them to the place of the skull, and they crucify him. And as the women are looking on, Jesus is praying for the people, and he's saying, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. As they're driving the nails in, and as they're crucifying him, he's praying for them. Could you do that? Not without the power of Jesus, I couldn't. 
and they're dividing up his clothes as often people do when people die. They leave their stuff and then there are all the squabbles over it. And so you have the soldiers squabbling over who's going to get what. We see that that was prophesied of. We see the rulers sneering at him. Well, if you're the son of God, why don't you come down off that cross? Heaping abuse on him. He saved others. Why don't you save yourself? The soldiers mocking him. The religious rulers were mocking him. There was this sign of, over his head that he was the king of the Jews. And the two criminals, one on either side, also heaping abuse on Jesus. I mean, there was absolutely no comfort at all at the cross. All of his disciples had left except for John and the women who were standing at a distance. And eventually one of the criminals sees everything Jesus does on the cross, like praying for those who are torturing him. And he understands that this is an innocent man and he is who he says he is. Don't know if he ever met him before in his ministry, but he calls out to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus says, truly, I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. And we see the entire world pictured on both of those crosses. The thief being crucified for what he deserved and the other one being crucified for what he deserved and yet finding grace because he recognized Jesus as Lord. So the whole world is split into those categories on either side of Jesus. We see that the, the curtain that was in the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, representing God opening up the way for us to go directly to him. The body of Jesus Christ was that curtain, if you will. And as Jesus died, the curtain was torn in two. We know that there was an earthquake and there were graves that were opened. And we understand that from the other gospels, all of what happened when Jesus died on the cross, how the sun was darkened that day for three hours, something a bit more supernatural than just an eclipse. And Jesus cries out in a loud voice to telestai, or it is finished, which means it's done. Your sin debt, my sin debt, is now paid in full. And your sin debt is paid in full for the things you do today and the things you haven't even done yet in the future. Jesus paid it all. To pay off a debt in full, you have to know exactly how much is owed. So you'll never surprise God by your failures. He already knows. And he already paid for them. If you know Jesus Christ is your Savior, you've accepted the free gift of what he offers. And we see the mourners. We see the women who were at a distance. We see that even one of the centurions is there. And he says, surely this was a God-fearing man. This was the, this was the son of God. Uh, we see from the various scriptures that even those who were at the foot of the cross who were mocking just earlier are now recognizing who he is. And it's amazing. Even his enemies declared who he was. And of course, they go to take his body down off the cross, you have Joseph of Arimathea and Nick at night, Nicodemus, who came to Jesus at night in chapter three. So these wealthy, well-to-do, well-positioned Sanhedrinites, if you will, I'm making up words now, <laughs> step forward out of the shadows and they declare themselves to be followers of Jesus, taking his body, defiling themselves for the sacrifice that would be done for the Passover and risking all of that to put Jesus in an unmarked tomb, one that no one had ever been laid in before. And so they take him and they wrap him quickly. We know Nicodemus has the wheelbarrow because he's got 100 pounds of spices and they're gonna throw spices on his body and wrap him up as quickly as possible because the time is ticking and the Sabbath is about to happen. The sun is about to go down. So they do a rush job to put him into the tomb and then they close it with a giant stone put in front of it. And I imagine the religious rulers and also Pilate and Herod, they think there's one less problem on my plate. It's all taken care of. It's finally done. Maybe the people will simmer down now. And yet we know that that's not the end of the story, but that's where we leave Jesus. We leave him at the cross and in the tomb. So this week, we're gonna talk about Jesus's resurrection, which is the foundation and the pinnacle of all Christian faith, 
is that there is a resurrection after death. We will stand before God and give an account of the things that are done in the body, the scripture says. And Jesus went there and came back, and he can tell you what it's like. So much more reliable than anything you find on TV. Well, I saw a light, and suddenly there was a train, and then there, was, there were mosquitoes, and then, yeah, okay. I'd rather talk to Jesus because he's already been there. Verse 1 of chapter 24. Now on the first day of the week, you guys realize that's Sunday, not Monday. Very early in the morning, they, meaning the women, and certain other women with them, came to the tomb bringing spices in which they had prepared. These women were going to finish embalming his body. He had the rush job and he was pushed in and the stone closed so they could all go home and practice the Sabbath. None of the women had any idea what was about to happen. Remember Jesus said that he would die at the hands of the sinful men and in three days he would rise. And no one understood what in the world he was talking about. These women are no different at this point because what are they doing? They're taking spices to finish the embalming. They're going there to see his body. They're not there to go see a resurrection. So there's no hope. And the women know where it is because they left him there. They know the temple, uh, the, the tomb rather. They know where he was left. And so that's where they're headed. And so some backstory before we even get there. The religious rulers come to Pilate and say, listen, while Jesus was alive, he said that in three days he would rise. So you better seal up that stone and you better post a guard. And so he says, okay, I can do that. It's amazing. The followers of Jesus didn't know what in the world Jesus meant. The religious rulers did. They understood. That's like when a non-Christian quotes to you, do not judge. Don't judge me, man. Yeah, apparently you know what the scripture says, huh? Matthew chapter 27, it says, Pilate said to them, you have a guard, go your way. Make it as secure as you know how. And so they went and made the tomb secure, sealing the stone and setting the guard. We're talking ropes and wax and a seal that said, if you touch this, it's under penalty of death. And they post a guard, which is a bunch of guards, not just a guard, because you know anything could happen with just one. And so they guard a tomb. I remember being in the military for seven years, and that has got to be the worst possible duty. Guarding a dead body. It's not going to go anywhere. I remember guarding a water tower once, all night. In the dark. No lights. Sounds of animals scurrying about. And I can imagine, here's the duty. Go to the cemetery and make sure nobody goes in or out of this tomb. Who in the world's going to go there? And it's probably, it's probably the people that are from the temple. It's probably the temple guards. Usually you see the, uh, the Roman guards there. And I always thought it was Roman guards. But then as I look at it, when all of this breaks down and Jesus shows, or, or one of the angels shows up to let uh, us in to see Jesus isn't there, they run to the chief priests. They don't go to Pilate. They go to the chief priest, which tells me those are the people that were probably their authority. So it may not have been a Roman guard. It may have been the chief priests and their own people because they had their own little, uh, you know, private guards. Mark 16, 3 says, and they said among themselves, who will roll away the stone from the door of the tomb from us? So the four different gospels give you four different accounts. And the ladies, as they talked, as they approached this tomb, they looked at each other and say, uh, we probably should have woke up one of the guys or a bunch of the guys because how are we going to roll the stone away? They just weren't thinking. You ever do that? You ever, like, you're on your way someplace and you go, oh, yeah, I forgot my wallet. Oh, my cell phone. Oh, I'm going to need that. Or perhaps you come to the, the potluck tonight you go, oh, yeah, food. I, I totally forgot the food. And by the way, there's a potluck tonight. It's at 
five o'clock. Everybody put your hand up, five o'clock. Look, see, it's interactive. Look, now we all know it's five o'clock. And the good food will be, you know, for the people that get here at five o'clock. Good, I'm so glad you picked that up. The only test of whether you're a teacher or not is if people learn, so some of you have. Five o'clock, very good. And, and while I'm remembering the things I forgot, this coming Saturday, we have a picnic. Yay. And you better be signed up. <laughs> you know who you are. Your name better be down and what tasty, delicious, savory thing it is that you're bringing. Because inquiring bellies want to know. So <laughs> the women are on their way and they say, oh my goodness, who's going to roll the stone away? Just like I said, oh my goodness, I forgot two announcements. You see, it, sometimes a kick in the head helps, sometimes the right verse. They said, who's going to roll the stone away as they approached? And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. And they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. Now, you might find it a little weird that the mausoleum is open and they desired to go in. Most people who have seen any scary movies, you don't go anywhere near dead bodies because, you know, anything can happen. But see, we don't embalm our own people. They did. They took care of their own. And so this is probably something they had done before. So they get there, and surprisingly, the stone has been rolled away. Well, before they got there, we understand from one of the other Gospels, there's an angel that shows up. There's an earthquake. And suddenly... This angel rolls the stone away and sits on it. Now, you, you're not thinking of little cherubs with wings and, you know, little bow and arrows. This is like one of these angels can kill 185,000 people in one night. So I imagine it was a bit more like, you know. So he, he rolls the stone away. And in Matthew, we get the story because Matthew's getting the story probably from the guards. And behold, there was a great earthquake for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. His countenance was like lightning and his clothes as white as snow. And the guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. These are trained soldiers who passed out. That's somebody you don't want to mess with. That's why whenever an angel shows up, everybody drops to the ground. These guys involuntarily. Everybody else usually takes a knee, puts their face down. In fact, in the book of Revelation, John is tempted to worship. And he goes, no, 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 don't, don't do that. I'm a servant like you. We'll just, we'll just do business. So he's like the doorman. And he said, ladies first. <clears throat> hey, open the door so the ladies could go in. And it's amazing. He says, go on in and see where he used to lay. He's not here. He's risen, just like he said. I, I, I hope you remember that anytime you're with a lady. Open the door. You'll be an angel. And they finally get to go in and look, and he's not there. And the stone, of course, we know was rolled away to let us in, not to keep Jesus, not to let Jesus out. It's so that we could actually go in, that the stone was rolled away. And by the way, Julie, Jesus is an early riser. Uh, for all of you that might not do mornings well, Jesus was an early riser. You, you, like Benjamin Franklin said, maybe you, early, that's one of the many things he said. Early bed, early rise makes a man healthy, wealthy, and wise. Right. I guess it doesn't go for women, but too critical. Anyway. And it happened as they were greatly perplexed about this because he wasn't there. And behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. And as they were afraid and they bowed their faces to the earth and said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? He's not here, but is risen. Remember 
how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying, the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and on the third day rise again. And they remembered his words. I find this very unusual. First of all, that there are angels there that have to remind them. How did they know? Is it true that there are angels and they actually are listening in? Apparently so. I just thought that was an interesting observation that I had never seen before. These guys are reminding them of what they heard first person from Jesus. Number one, they have good memories something I lack. And number two, they were probably there and heard it, which makes me wonder what else they hear. And so there are these two men. It's interesting. Uh, some call them angels. Some call them men. We see the, those who met with Abraham back in Genesis. They're called men who come, but we know that they're angels. We find out later. So we know that when angels appear to human beings, they appear to be human. So that's a that's a principle. So if you see some large winged creature show up, I'm going to scratch my head a little bit. <laughs> Psalm 1610 also gives us a slight preview of what's going to happen here. It says, for you will not leave my soul in Sheol, which is uh, the grave, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption or degradation, if you will. This is a messianic Psalm that talks about the coming of Jesus, how he wouldn't be left to die and rot as a corpse. And it was prophesied long before Jesus ever came. It's interesting that there are two angels. There's one at the head and one at the foot of where Jesus was. It's the very picture of the mercy seat in the Old Testament. You remember that place where the blood would be sprinkled. You remember what was inside the Ark of the Covenant underneath that mercy seat was a copy of the law, which... You weren't supposed to open that cover <laughs> because what you're doing is you're removing mercy from the law. And what are you going to be without mercy from the law? And so there are these angels which picture the Old Testament Ark of the Covenant. So the women are there. They talk with some angels. The angels say he's risen and they're on their way back. And they returned from the tomb and told all these things to 11 and to all the rest. It was, now here's the list, Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women with them, and told them these things to the apostles. And their words seemed to them like idle tales, and they did not believe them. There's a whole lot of disbelief going on here. The women didn't believe it when they heard it. They go back and report it, and the disciples don't believe them. Is there like a silver lining in this story? Is there anyone who will champion Jesus and believe? The women come and plead with the men and let them know what goes on. But they're said that there were idle tales, nonsense. And here's a word I was reminded of, twaddle. Your vocabulary word of the day is twaddle. I actually got that out of a Bible dictionary. Anyway, these women are emotional. These women are emotional. Guys, you're unhinged. Okay, Jesus died. I get it. Have a seat. Have some chamomile tea or something. Relax. They didn't believe them. Now, something that you might not know. The disciples did not believe his words and his warnings, and they would not believe the eyewitness accounts of the women who knew him. You would think, these women know what they're talking about. They walked with Jesus for years. And they don't believe the women either. Witness after witness after witness, and they don't believe. Does that sound like anyone you know? <laughs> women were not considered reliable witnesses, and their testimony was not admissible in court. So you've come a long way, baby. And the funny thing is, Jesus changed all that, didn't he? Because who did he appear to first? Women. The women, because the last are first and the first are last. 
And that's just the way Jesus does things. And Jesus changes all of that by going to the women first. I think that's significant. There's another incident where we're going to come upon where Mary Magdalene actually goes back to the tomb. And you're going to find this in the other Gospels where it's not here in the book of Luke because his focus is different. But we're going to see Mary Magdalene that actually goes back. And there's going to be another woman who has to tell an account of what happens. But Peter arose... When he hears this news, he hears it from the women, he arose and he ran to the tomb, stooping down. He saw the linen clothes lying by themselves, and he departed, marveling to himself at what he had happened at what had happened. So Peter hears this and he's like, Oh, stinking Romans. And Peter's he's an action man. He's immediately motivated to action before he thinks. And he tears off running. Well, the funny thing is, we all have a certain point of view, don't we? You know, you you will have a different story as to how this service went today than I do. Simply because we're in two different places and we see through different eyes. This is what we're told. And as far as we know, Peter's the only one that runs there. Right? Because the focus is Peter, at least in Luke's gospel. But the funny thing is, in the book of John, we're given... Another side of the story, Peter, therefore, went out and the other disciple, by the way, in the book of John, when John writes about the other disciple or the disciple whom Jesus loved, he's being coy, he's being humble, and he's not mentioning himself by name. So keep that in mind in the story. And the other disciple, and they were going to the tomb, and they both ran together. And oh, we'll see, the scripture's not right. One, one version says it was just Peter. The other one says it was John and Peter. Which was it? Well, it's just another form of the story. It's the same story. I'm sure there were two of them. But Luke didn't feel it important to mention John since John doesn't feel important to mention himself half the time. Didn't mention him. And then he says, and so they both ran together and the other disciple outran Peter and came to the tomb first. You get to see a little bit of John's flesh come out of there, I think. It's a little whisper of it. You know, they, they both, Peter and, Peter and the, the other disciple ran. The, the other disciple ran faster. Because Peter was probably shaped like me, not for fast running. More like heavy lifting. And John was younger. And so John tears off and beats him. And he just thought, we should all know that for eternity. He puts that in the word. And he, meaning the disciple who outran Peter, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying there, yet he did not go in. That's funny, it's not mentioned in Luke's gospel. And then Simon Peter came, uh, huffing like a freight train, following him and went into the tomb. And he saw the linen cloths lying there, and the handkerchief that had been around his head. Now, John's giving us some detail we didn't see in Luke. Not lying with the linen cloths, but folded together in a place by itself. And the other disciple who came to the tomb first went in also and saw and believed. Now we're given an observation from a first person point of view from John. John runs there as fast as he can. He gets there. And he looks in and he sees everything, but he doesn't go in. He has a reverence for such things. Peter runs up, out of my way, and storms in. Doesn't doesn't care if it's full of rattlesnakes. He doesn't care. He's going in. You get to see the character of these men. And he's not, these two guys are not so unlike us, are they? Some of us are a run-in, you know, devil-may-care attitude. And then there are others of us that are, a bit more respectful and careful. And John actually believes. He's like, this is weird because they found all of his clothes lying there, the linens, but then the handkerchief that was on his face was folded up and put aside. If you're going to rob a body, you don't strip him down naked and throw him over your shoulder. You don't fold up a napkin that's on his face and put it in a separate place. If you're going to steal a body, you take the whole thing, spices and all, over your shoulder. 
<laughs> Not that I have experience with these things. <laughs> but you see, John sees this and he's like, this is not a kidnapping. Something, something's going on. And he believed, which is kind of neat. And this is John's view. Of course, in Luke, we're given Peter's view, so you don't hear John even mentioned. But you do when you hear John's take on it. Jesus was not, was not only an early riser, but he also made his own bed. So to all of you, I switched into parenting mode. Another example of two people seeing the same thing differently. And there are people that take variations like this in the Gospels and they say, see, this can't be a true story because, well, goodness sake, you see an accident out on the street and you and I will have two different versions of it. I'll see things you didn't, you'll see things I didn't. You put them all together and you got the full story. And you have another view, which is Mary. Mary is, you don't see, but she's in the midst of following Peter and John, but she's not going to run with the dress down to her knees or, or below her knees. She's, she's going at a quicker pace, but Mary Magdalene is not running. And in the book of John, we're given her point of view after they come in. The men come in, they see what's going on, and they leave. And Mary Magdalene takes up the, the tale and comes and beginning in verse 11. And Mary stood outside the tomb weeping. And she wept and she stooped down and she looked into the tomb and she saw two angels in white sitting. So we still have angels. Interesting. They didn't appear to the men, but to the women they did. One at the head and the other at the feet where the body of Jesus had lain. And they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Remember, they told them. Mary Magdalene was one of them. He's, he's not here. He's alive. He's in Galilee. He's still around. They were told this, but the women went back to the men and the men said, twaddle. You know, they said, you guys are all emotional women. You're out of control. So what happened between the time that she went reporting it and the time that she got back? She starts to not believe. She starts to doubt because of the word of the men. You know, your unbelief is contagious. Just like your faith is. And so they say, why are you weeping? We, we already told you. She said to them, because, you have taken a, because they have taken away my Lord and I do not know where they have laid him. Do you see? She suddenly doesn't have faith, even though she was told already by the angels. He's alive. They took him away. Who's they? They took him away. The stinking Romans. Could have been she talked to Peter. And she went away with the story. And she begins to doubt. To the point where she's crying in front of angels who already told her. What, what's wrong with you? We just told you the news. Now she had, when she had said this, she turned around and she saw Jesus standing there and did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Same words. Whom are you seeking? Ah, a little closer to the truth. She's supposing him to be the gardener, must have been a flannel shirt, said to him, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him and I will take him away. Another emotional statement. How much do you think Mary Magdalene weighs? Tell me where Jesus is and I'll throw this 200 pound man on my back and take him away. Do you ever say things that are just emotional and not true without thinking? I think Mary Magdalene was overshooting a little, don't you think? Tell me where you've laid him and I will come myself and I will carry him away. You know, when people are grieving, they say wild things. Yeah. This is one of them. Supposing him to be the gardener. Tell me where you've laid him and I'll carry him away. Jesus said to her, one word, Mary. He probably said it in Aramaic, which is Miriam. Now, there are a lot of Marys, but he said it in a special way 
where she knew it was Jesus because only Jesus speaks to her like that. Mary. And then she turned to him and said, Rabboni, which is to say teacher or rabbi. Jesus said to her, do not cling to me for I have not yet ascended to my father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father and to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things to her. What do you think their response was? They didn't believe her. But she didn't believe either until Jesus makes a personal appearance. And with just a word. It's interesting because we see all of these post-resurrection showings up of Jesus and people don't recognize him readily. He's been through a lot. They pulled his beard out. They beat him. They thrust a spear through his side into his pericardium and yanked it out so there was blood and water that came out of his body. He's been hung on a cross. He's been beaten on his back to a bloody mess. And suddenly, there's something about Jesus that's different. I don't know if it was the torture or the resurrection. I'm thinking it'll be the resurrection. Unbelief is contagious. It can blind us to the truth and from Jesus himself, where she didn't even recognize him when he was there. But that's a, it's just a rather interesting thing. Now, behold, two of them were traveling the same day to a village called Emmaus. Unless you're from Pennsylvania, then it's Emos. Which was seven miles from Jerusalem. And they talked together of all the things which had happened. So we're... We pull back from the story of the women telling the disciples and the disciples running to the tomb and not finding him and running away. We're given the longest post-resurrection story that the scriptures have to offer us about two people taking a walk, going from Jerusalem and going to Emmaus on this very same day. It's exclusively found in the book of Luke, like many things are exclusive to Luke. And by the way, there are four different places called Emmaus, just to make it difficult for you. Um, but we know exactly how far away it is, and thankful to the scripture, we know that it's seven and a half miles away. Um, Emmaus means warm baths. So apparently there were more than just one town you could go to get a warm bath. The village where the two disciples were going, the Lord appeared to them on the way, the day of the resurrection. Luke makes its distance from Jerusalem, 60 strata, in case you were wondering, or seven and a half miles, 12 kilometers. And Josephus mentions a village called Emmaus of the same distance. The site of Emmaus still remains unidentified. So we've got four different locations, but you can see this one is only four miles away. These are seven and a half miles, and there are two of them. And then there's one over here, which was uh, renamed Nicopolis. Um, so take your pick. You guys have a little something to argue about later. And so it was, while they conversed and they reasoned, that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were restrained. Do you see that? So that they did not know him. And he said to them, what kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk and are sad? <laughs> what an interesting question. Jesus ever walk up to you and say, what is this that you're all twisted up about and what happened to your face? Why the long face? Jesus in, is inviting them to tell the story. Now, when the one whose name was Cleopas answered and said to him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? And have you not known the things which happened there in these days? So I like Cleopas because he's sarcastic. He immediately says, what, did you grow up in a cabbage patch? You don't know what's been going on here? I mean, this is like big news. This is like, we, 
This is Jesus. We're, we're talking about everything that happened in Jerusalem. Mark 16, 12 says that after that, he appeared in another form to two of them as he walked and he went into the country and they went and told it to the rest, but they did not believe him either. Mark gives us the short version. By the way, Mark is the shortest of the four gospels and he gets to the facts, just the facts, ma'am. Just bottom line. It says that he appeared to them in another form. Don't you find that interesting? In other words, he's highlighting the fact that they didn't recognize immediately that it was Jesus, which tells me something happened. Something happened post-resurrection. So they're walking along and they're hashing out all of the events that happened in Jerusalem. So it's just another appearance where Jesus isn't readily recognized. And Jesus then asks them, what things? We call that in Jersey playing dumb. What things? Pastor, did you hear about so-and-so? What? I might know full well all of the details, <laughs> but I will not tell you. I will let you tell me, and I will correct you. <laughs> These guys didn't realize who they were talking to. And he says, what things have happened? And so they said to him, these things concerning Jesus of Nazareth. For he was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people. By the way, that's a half-baked answer, isn't it? That's not exactly who Jesus was. And how the chief priests and the rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and they crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since these things happened. So these guys dumped their guts and they said, listen, we thought he was going to be this awesome prophet that would come in and straighten everything out. They fell short. Their ideas were half-baked about who Jesus was. And Jesus is going to straighten them out. Notice Jesus' patient, loving, welcoming manner for them to dump their guts on him. He's not condemning of them. He says, so tell me, what are you talking about? You country bumpkin, where are you coming from? You know, that's what they're saying. And he lets them voice all of their doubts and all of their confusion. And I can tell you on the road, they're not singing, uh, you're never gonna let, never gonna let me down. It's the opposite. The unexpected death of Jesus shook their faith and challenged their expectations. Have you ever had that happen? You ever have something happen that just absolutely shatters you and you're like, where's God? Where's God in this? When things are going well, it's easy to say, you're never going to let me down. And then another time when you have to see with the eyes of faith and understand things from God's point of view and not your own. So Jesus was right there with them and they did not know it. You know, it's in the places where we're going through the worst times of our life that Jesus is right there and we don't recognize him. Just like this. He's right there. But we don't recognize him. It's not God's fault. It's our fault. Right? So they say, Yes, which means Jesus probably said, really? And they said, yes. And certain women of our company who, who arrived at the tomb early astonished us because all the guys were snoring and sleeping in. They did not find his body and they came to us to saying that they had seen a vision of angels. I'm sure he said it that way. Who said he was alive. And certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. So he gives them the short version of everything that happened. Gives them the tidy answer. Everybody's been there and we don't know what's going on. His body's gone. We thought he was going to be all that and he just wasn't. And then he, meaning Jesus, said to them, this is just a stranger that happened to walk up behind them as they were walking and having a conversation. And Jesus says, so what are you talking about? What's, what's the trouble? Why, why does your face look like that? And they explain in more detail. 
And Jesus, a total stranger to them, responds like this. O oh, foolish ones, and slow to heart to believe in all of the prophets that have, what they have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. These guys were all twisted up. Jesus shows up and says, boy, ye of little faith. <laughs> Jesus said that how often during his ministry to them. And so slow of heart to believe all the things that the scriptures have said. You see, they don't have a sorrow problem. They have a belief problem. And beginning with Moses, by the way, Moses wrote Genesis, so that's the beginning. And all the prophets, all of the prophets, good thing they had seven and a half miles, that was a sermon. All of the, prophets, uh, all of the, the prophets, he exhorted to them from the scriptures, everything in the scriptures concerning himself. Now that's a Bible study you want to be at. That's a service you want to attend. So Jesus is now telling them how the Messiah would have to suffer. I can only imagine he talked about Isaiah 53, that he would be despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid our face, as it were, from him. He was despised and he did not, did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken and smitten of God and afflicted. <laughs> Let's be ready. Let us do good while we may. Speak the truth to people while we can. Love them as Jesus would have them love, as have them loved. Pray with me. Father, I pray that you prepare our hearts, that you might help us as we go, that we right, might remember rightly that this is not our home. Prepare us, Lord, to take as many as you would have along with us. Help us to be open. Help us to shine for you. I pray that you give us the strength to do that. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless, guys.